Good morning. My name is Pastor Jason Pittman. I'm the pastor of the Sepulga Charge in the area of Georgiana, and I would like to welcome you to our second online sermon. With that being said, and without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to Samantha Pittman. She does the children's sermon, and she has a very interesting message this morning. Samantha? First, I want to tell you about a very interesting book called Believe It or Not by Robert Rip Ripley. Mr. Ripley enjoyed collecting strange and amazing bits of information, which, although they seem unbelievable, were true. Let me read you some examples of some of the amazing things that you will find in his book. A man by the name of James Cook once had a chicken that laid perfectly square eggs. Now, I've seen white eggs, brown eggs, and even spotted eggs, but I have never seen a square egg. Have you? I think I'd have to see it to believe it. Joanne Barnes was a 15 year old from California and she once swung a lot of hula hoops on her body at the same time. How many do you think she swung on her body? 68. Can you believe that? I can't even keep one hula hoop going. I think I would have to see that to believe it. Here's one I'll bet you didn't know. How long do you think the world's largest monkey was? 3,000 feet. The world's largest monkey was over 3,000 feet long. It weighed 885 pounds and took 103 butchers to carry it. Now that's a lot of baloney. I would have to, I would have to see that to believe it. This book is filled with things that are very hard for me to believe. But do you know what? If it is, if it is true, it's true whether I believe it or not. In today's Bible, Bible lesson, we will learn that on the Sunday that Jesus rose from the grave, he appeared to a group of his disciples. One of the disciples, whose name was Thomas, was not with them. When the disciple told Thomas that they had seen Jesus and that he was still alive, Thomas said, I won't believe it until I see it with my own eyes. I want to put my finger in the nail, nail prints in his hand and place my hand where the spear was thrust into his side. A week later, Thomas saw Jesus. Jesus invited Thomas to touch his hands, where the nails have been. He told Thomas to put his hands in the wound in his side. Then, then Thomas believed. Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. A lot of people today won't believe that Jesus really rose from the grave because they haven't seen him with their own two eyes. Do you know what? It is true whether they believe it or not. You and I have never seen Jesus, but we believe. We accept him by faith. We don't have to see it to believe it. Dear Jesus, thank you that you have helped us accept by faith that you have risen from the grave and that you are still alive. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Samantha. You know, nowadays with all the challenges in our life, uh, we've got coronavirus, we've got financial struggles, uh, it's stemming worldwide. Um, we may have a lot of doubt, but with that, I would like to read about something that, in a sense, um, maybe, maybe we'll provide hope amidst all this chaos, amidst all the challenges of this world. So I hope to help instill that back in you today if you are going through this season of doubt, this season of chaos, this season of even sickness, uh, maybe financial distress, who knows what you're going through, but Jesus is hope. Let us pray. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Today's scripture is 1 Peter 1 verses 3 through 9. 
and I'm going to be reading the NLT version. 1 Peter 1, verses 3 through 9, if you care to turn in your Bibles and follow along. This is the hope of eternal life. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again, because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation. And we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation, which is already to be revealed on the last day for all to see. So be truly glad. There's wonderful joy ahead. Even though you must endure many trials for a, la a little while, these trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as a fire tests and purifies gold. Through your faith, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold, so when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. You love him even though you have never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him, and you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. The reward for trusting him will be salvation for your soul. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of that scripture. So some of us may remember if, we've, uh, if we're movie, movie goers or movie watchers. Um, in fact, you can often see reruns on certain channels. Um, but today I want to start out with uh, something from Susan Robbins' Hunger Games. There's a telling exchange between President Snow, who fears that Katniss Everdeen's victory will foment, foment revolution in far-flung districts, and the game master, Seneca Crane. President Snow says, hope, it is the only thing stronger than fear. A little hope is effective. A lot of hope is dangerous. A spark is fine, as long as it's contained. So at this point, Seneca Crane says, so? And Snow replies, so contain it. I'm going to tell you, brothers and sisters, that's right now. That's what the enemy wants. He wants to contain your hope. He wants you to doubt. But God wants us to have hope. What oxygen is to the lungs, hope is to the soul. We're a nation holding on to hope. And today we're looking at why Christians should have hope even in these troubled times. This should give us optimism. It should transform our lives and remind us of our inheritance. Right now we have the coronavirus raging worldwide. You see about it on the, on the social media. You see about it on the TV, on the media, on the news. Everywhere you turn, coronavirus, coronavirus, coronavirus. This is a very serious issue. It brings us doubt. But amidst this, God and Jesus Christ bring us hope. Right now, in six months' time, hopefully it will be a thing of the past. Hang on to God. Everything will be right as soon, and God will have his say in this matter. So we're here toward the beginning of Peter's epistle, and he starts by saying, Praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because he raises Jesus from the dead, he has made us be born again to a living expectation. What's more, as a matter of first importance, it reveals to us something about our past by saying that we have been born once more. What Peter is inferring to here is that we were born previously brought into the, into the world a first time. Our birth, though, at this point was insufficient. It was merely physical. What's more, Peter is saying here, just after what he gained from his master, Jesus Christ, remember what Jesus say, said to Nicodemus, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except if one is born again, he can't see the kingdom of God. So you had a first birth. It was insufficient. It wasn't good enough not for this goal. That, that was your introduction to the world as indicated by flesh, your physical birth. Be that as it may, it won't be our first birth. You and I were caught in our transgressions in reality, in our wicked condition, our fallen evil nature, which we acquired from our ancestor Adam. That birth will just end in death. So we need a subsequent birth, another one, an entirely different life, so as to enter the realm of God and live until the end of time, we have to be born again. This sounds crazy, but God is not crazy. God can do the impossible. We can be born again. Let me explain. 
That is the thing that Peter's getting at when he says that we Christians have been born once again. He's discussing our otherworldly resurrection. Once more, this is directly in accordance with what Jesus said. He said, you should be conceived of water and the spirit. Also, brothers and sisters, that is a thing that occurred in your submersion. You were born again, conceived of water and the spirit, the spirit working through the inventive and groundbreaking expression of God in and with the water. Let's talk about what Peter has said here. He said that it was God who has made us be born once more. We didn't do it. I want to make that clear. Let me say it again. It was God who has made us born again. We did not do it. We are only human. God did it. It wasn't what you did by settling on your choice for Jesus, as if you can make yourself be born again. No, God made us born again, and he did it through his nurturing word. Then Peter says, you've been brought into the world again through the living and standing expression of God. Also, this word is uplifting news that has been taught to you. And in section three, Peter says, immersion presently spares you. So it is the gospel word, the uplifting news of Jesus Christ that was taught to you in the triune name of God that gives us sanctification. It's sparing force that this is the gospel word and implies that God uses it to make us born again and born again to a living expectation. So when God made you born again, this will have had a significant impact in your life, giving you living expectation. Be that as it may, the demonstration of God in your life is itself dependent on and associated with a past demonstration of God, which is the restoration of Christ from death. He brought him up. From the dead he defeated death christ was dead and now he's risen furthermore in that lies an unequivocal demonstration in its entirety of our history christ's res restoration from the dead offers substance to the good news it connects us to christ and holy baptism and it frames the reason for the de for the desire for our own revival through the revival of jesus christ from the dead so at this point ask yourself why did jesus need to die he had no sins of his own for which he deserved to be crucified, especially in the manner he was. It was horrible. Not by any stretch of the imagination did he deserve it. However, Christ, the Son of God, God's only Son, willingly took on our transgressions and our blame before God. He took on the demise that every single one of us deserves. I should stop right there. That should be hope enough in these times right now. Jesus Christ died for our sins so that we can live forever. That should be hope enough. He took our place on the cross. This is the reason that he took on an undeserved death with the goal that our transgressions would be pardoned. They would be excused. He would go before the accuser and before Jesus, before God and say, look, God, I died for this person. He accepted me. Don't be the one. He says, I knew you not. This is the reason he took it on with the goal that we should be pardoned. His penance offering reparations for our wrongdoings. Furthermore, with that boundary of sin gone and his gift of eternal life for all of us, the intensity of death was ousted. It was defeated, gone, out of here. Nothing to keep us from God or in between us from God any longer. Things have been put right in harmony with our God. Our creator has been reestablished. Death has been defeated. Jesus imparts his triumph to us. We are associated with Christ. It is new life now. It's a fresh start with a guarantee of everlasting life to come. The grave won't hold us just as it couldn't hold Jesus Christ. Revival is coming. Here is genuine hope in sinners like you and like me. Born again to a living hope. It discloses to us something about our present and our future. It implies we have a future to anticipate a strong, secure future and through a blind, a faith, a blissful life on earth. So at this point, I just want to clarify this. A living expectation, hope, scripturally and consistently has referenced what is to come. Expectation anticipates a splendid future, a great future, an incredible future, a sublime future. What's more, this expectation is only a gentle wish. It's a firm and sure expectation tied down in the promises of God. 
And there's nothing more sure than a promise from God. Peter enlightens us concerning this future in our content. He says, we have been born again to a living expectation, an inheritance that is enduring. It is immaculate. It is unfading. It is kept in paradise for you and for me. Inheritance, that's the thing that we're all in line to get. That's what we're fighting here for. But it's already won. The battle is already won. Jesus died on the cross for us. It's a sinless legacy and no one can disturb it. An unfading legacy being kept in paradise for you, where it will stay sheltered and secure. See, financial markets, let's think about right now. They're uncertain. They go here. They go there. Speculations can change. It's a guessing game. Up, down. It's like a roller coaster all the time. But however, all that aside, you can depend on your inheritance. It's a sure thing. You can invest fully in that. God is guarding us. He's keeping our faith solid. We need him to do this since we live amidst numerous things in this time that would tear down our faith and tear us apart from Jesus Christ. The trials that Peter's perusers were being lamented with included extreme oppression for the Christian faith, even to the degree of detainment in prison or death. That's what they had to go through. I wouldn't die for a lie, and I imagine none of you would. We're not to that point in our nation despite the fact that Christians are right now progressively being confronted with disparager fights in court for being faithful to the word of God. We are under fire, brothers and sisters. It's a trial and an attempt to conform God. We are going to change God? <laughs> Let me make this clear to you right now. God will not change. We might be able to change the ink in this book. We are warned against that, but God is not going to change. He won't falter. He won't fail. Not now, not ever. His word is in stone. It is forever. The trials we often face are increasingly just normal things, though. They're challenges that many of us face, things that make us question God. I know some of us are at that point right now to give up on God, lose faith. Why, God, why? The harsh reality through everyday life when we wonder if God is even watching out for us. We question God because some of us have physical ailments, diseases. We have pain in our bodies every single day. We're waking up and it just hurts. We have overwhelming depression. We have anxiety that burdens our consciousness. I mean, I'm telling you, some of us may be even addicted to things and nobody knows, but inside we know and it's bothering us. Bad things happen to our friends and our family and we just cry out to God and it seems like they're not winning. We have financial problems. We wonder if we're ever going to make it, especially look at how many people are losing their jobs right now. Are you losing faith? God's going to come. He's going to make it right. His word says so. We have strife and pressure in our lives every single day. We have it in our family lives, in our work lives, in our maybe sitting at home lives because we want to get out. We want to do things and we're unable to right now. Things are running out and it seems like times are bleak right now. We have uncertainty. Why, God? Why? Have you encountered any of this? I'm pretty sure you have. But since God is watching over us, these are only tests. It's only a season. It's refining our faith, and it's making us more grounded as Christians together. Our faith can be tested like gold. Think of it like that. We're fined in the fire. The fire blazes to consume with extreme heat the dross, leaving the gold purer. It's the same with our faith. Think about it. The fire is agonizing at times. It's challenging. It's hot. It burns. But when we get through it, when we come through it on the other side, the other side of that season, our faith is pure because it's been tested. As we experience these different challenges in life, Hold on to faith. We have a far more superior future before us, and our God is far more superior than any challenge in our lifetime on this earth because we're promised a future in his kingdom. Our future is secure in Christ. 
It's not like the stock market that can bottom out at any time, but I promise you, Jesus is as solid as a rock. He is the rock. He is a strong foundation. It won't fail. Our legacy is awaiting us and nothing can take it away. It's by faith for a salvation fit to be revealed in the end. That will happen at the revelation of Jesus Christ. On the day when he returns, this is the Christian's incredible expectation. This is coming with faith. And it gives us extraordinary peace, even amidst this chaos right now, this chaos during this COVID-19 season. The expectation is so extraordinary. We can hold strong and remain faithful even amidst our troubles. Brothers and sisters in Christ, our Lord Jesus has risen from the dead, having won our forgiveness on the cross and having assured our resurrection on the final days. God has joined us to Christ in our baptism. We are connected now. There's no sin separating anything. We have been born again to a living hope. This hope gives us strength and joy in the midst of all sorts of trials. This is the sure hope of eternal life that we have in Christ Jesus, our Savior. And finally, Peter says to us, you love him even though you have never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him and you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. The reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. And to that, praise God that we have been born again to a living hope. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Remain steadfast. Remain faithful, brothers and sisters. We're going to get through this season. God is going to carry us. God bless.